Chapter 4 With a deep unconscious sigh which not even the nearness of the telescreen could prevent him from uttering when his day's work started, Winston pulled the speak right towards him, blew the dust from its mouthpiece, and put on his spectacles. Then he unrolled and clipped together four small cylinders of paper which had already flopped out of the pneumatic tube on the right-hand side of his desk. In the walls of the cubicle there were three orifices. To the right of the speak right, a small pneumatic tube for written messages, to the left a larger one for newspapers, and in the side wall within easy reach of Winston's arm, a large oblong slit protected by a wire grating. This last was for the disposal of waste paper. Similar slits existed in thousands or tens of thousands throughout the building, not only in every room but at short intervals in every corridor. For some reason they were nicknamed memory holes. When one knew that any document was due for destruction, or even when one saw a scrap of waste paper lying about, it was an automatic action to lift the flap of the nearest memory hole and drop it in, whereupon it would be whirled away on a current of warm air to the enormous furnaces which were hidden somewhere in the recesses of the building. Winston examined the four slips of paper which he had unrolled. Each contained a message of only one or two lines, in the abbreviated jargon, not actually newspeak, but consisting largely of newspeak words, which was used in the ministry for internal purposes. They ran, Times the 17th of March 84, BB Speech Mal reported Africa Rectify. Times the 19th of December 83, Forecasts 3YP 4th Quarter 83 Misprints Verify Current Issue. Times the 14th of February 84, Mini Plenty Mal Quoted Chocolate Rectify. Times March 12, 83, reporting BB Day Order Double Plus, ungood refs on persons rewrite fullwise up sub anti filing. With a faint feeling of satisfaction, Winston laid the fourth message aside. It was an intricate and responsible job and had better be dealt with last. The other three were routine matters, though the second one would probably mean some tedious wading through lists of figures. Winston dialed back numbers on the telescreen and called for the appropriate issues of the Times, which slid out of the pneumatic tube after only a few minutes' delay. The messages he had received referred to articles or news items which for one reason or another it was thought necessary to alter, or, as the official phrase had it, to rectify. For example, it appeared from the Times of the 17th of March that Big Brother, in his speech of the previous day, had predicted that the South Indian Front would remain quiet, but that a Eurasian offensive would shortly be launched in North Africa. As it happened, the Eurasian Higher Command had launched its offensive in South India and left North Africa alone. It was therefore necessary to rewrite a paragraph of Big Brother's speech in such a way as to make him predict the thing that had actually happened. Or again, the Times of the 19th of December had published the official forecasts of the output of various classes of consumption goods in the fourth quarter of 1983, which was also the sixth quarter of the ninth three-year plan. Today's issue contained a statement of the actual output, from which it appeared that the forecasts were in every instance grossly wrong. Winston's job was to rectify the original figures by making them agree with the later ones. As for the third message, it referred to a very simple ur roar which could be set right in a couple of minutes. As short a time ago as February, the Ministry of Plenty had issued a promise, a categorical pledge, were the official words, that there would be no reduction of the chocolate ration during 1984. Actually, as Winston was aware, the chocolate ration was to be reduced from 30 grams to 20 at the end of the present week. All that was needed was to substitute for the original promise a warning that it would probably be necessary to reduce the ration at some time in April. As soon as Winston had dealt with each of the messages, he clipped his speak-written corrections to the appropriate copy of the Times and pushed them into the pneumatic tube. Then, with a movement which was as nearly as possible unconscious, he crumpled up the original message and any notes that he himself had made and dropped them into the memory hole to be devoured by the flames. What happened in the unseen labyrinth to which the pneumatic tubes led, he did not know in detail, but he did know in general terms. As soon as all the corrections which happened to be necessary in any particular number of the times had been assembled and collated, that number would be reprinted, the original copy destroyed, and the corrected copy placed on the files in its stead. This process of continuous alteration was applied not only to newspapers, but to books, 
periodicals, pamphlets, posters, leaflets, films, soundtracks, cartoons, photographs, to every kind of literature or documentation which might conceivably hold any political or ideological significance. Day by day and almost minute by minute the past was brought up to date. In this way every prediction made by the party could be shown by documentary evidence to have been correct, nor was any item of news or any expression of opinion which conflicted with the needs of the moment ever allowed to remain on record. All history was a palimpsest, scraped clean and reinscribed exactly as often as was necessary. In no case would it have been possible, once the deed was done, to prove that any falsification had taken place. The largest section of the records department, far larger than the one on which Winston worked, consisted simply of persons whose duty it was to track down and collect all copies of books, newspapers, and other documents which had been superseded and were due for destruction. A number of the times which might, because of changes in political alignment or mistaken prophecies uttered by Big Brother, have been rewritten a dozen times still stood on the files bearing its original date, and no other copy existed to contradict it. Books also were recalled and rewritten again and again, and were invariably reissued without any admission that any alteration had been made. Even the written instructions which Winston received and which he invariably got rid of as soon as he had dealt with them, never stated or implied that an act of forgery was to be committed. Always the reference was to slips, errors, misprints, or misquotations which it was necessary to put right in the interests of accuracy. But actually, he thought, as he readjusted the Ministry of Plenty's figures, it was not even forgery. It was merely the substitution of one piece of nonsense for another. Most of the material that you were dealing with had no connection with anything in the real world, not even the kind of connection that is contained in a direct lie. Statistics were just as much a fantasy in their original version as in their rectified version. A great deal of the time you were expected to make them up out of your head. For example, the Ministry of Plenty's forecast had estimated the output of boots for the quarter at 145 million pairs. The actual output was given as 62 millions. Winston, however, in rewriting the forecast, marked the figure down to 57 million so as to allow for the usual claim that the quota had been overfulfilled. In any case, 62 millions was no nearer the truth than 57 millions or than 145 million s. Very likely no boots had been produced at all. Likelier still, nobody knew how many had been produced, much less cared. All one knew was that every quarter astronomical numbers of boots were produced on paper, while perhaps half the population of Oceania went barefoot. And so it was with every class of recorded fact, great or small. Everything faded away into a shadow world in which finally even the date of the year had become uncertain. Winston glanced across the hall. In the corresponding cubicle on the other side, a small, precise-looking, dark-chinned man named Tillotson was working steadily away, with a folded newspaper on his knee and his mouth very close to the mouthpiece of the speakwrite. He had the air of trying to keep what he was saying a secret between himself and the telescreen. He looked up and his spectacles darted a hostile flash in Winston's direction. Winston hardly knew Tillotson and had no idea what work he was employed on. People in the records department did not readily talk about their jobs. In the long windowless hall with its double row of cubicles and its endless rustle of papers and hum of voices murmuring into speak rights, there were quite a dozen people whom Winston did not even know by name, though he daily saw them hurrying to and fro in the corridors or gesticulating in the two minutes' hate. He knew that in the cubicle next to him the little woman with sandy hair toiled day in day out, simply at tracking down and deleting from the press the names of people who had been vaporized and were therefore considered never to have existed. There was a certain fitness in this since her own husband had been vaporized a couple of years earlier. And a few cubicles away a mild, ineffectual, dreamy creature named Ampleforth with very hairy ears and a surprising talent for juggling with rhymes and meters was engaged in producing garbled versions, definitive texts they were called, of poems which had become ideologically offensive but which for one reason or another were to be retained in the anthologies. And this hall, with its fifty workers or thereabouts, was only one subsection, a single cell, as it were, in the huge complexity of the records department. Beyond, above, below were other swarms of workers engaged in an unimaginable multitude of jobs. 
There were the huge printing shops with their sub-editors, their typography experts, and their elaborately equipped studios for the faking of photographs. There was the teleprogram section with its engineers, its producers, and its teams of actors specially chosen for their skill in imitating voices. There were the armies of reference clerks whose job was simply to draw up lists of books and periodicals which were due for recall. There were the vast repositories where the corrected documents were stored and the hidden furnaces where the original copies were destroyed. And somewhere or other, quite anonymous, there were the directing brains who coordinated the whole effort and laid down the lines of policy which made it necessary that this fragment of the past should be preserved, that one falsified, and the other rubbed out of existence. And the records department, after all, was itself only a single branch of the Ministry of Truth, whose primary job was not to reconstruct the past, but to supply the citizens of Oceania with newspapers, films, textbooks, telescreen programs, plays, novels, with every conceivable kind of information, instruction, or entertainment, from a statue to a slogan, from a lyric poem to a biological treatise, and from a child's spelling book to a newspeak dictionary. And the ministry had not only to supply the multifarious needs of the party, but also to repeat the whole operation at a lower level for the benefit of the proletariat. There was a whole chain of separate departments dealing with proletarian literature, music, drama, and entertainment generally. Here were produced rubbishy newspapers containing almost nothing except sport, crime, and astrology, sensational five-cent novelettes, films oozing with sex, and sentimental songs which were composed entirely by mechanical means on a special kind of kaleidoscope known as a versificator. There was even a whole subsection, pornosec it was called in Newspeak, engaged in producing the lowest kind of pornography, which was sent out in sealed packets and which no party member, other than those who worked on it, was permitted to look at. Three messages had slid out of the pneumatic tube while Winston was working, but they were simple matters, and he had disposed of them before the two minutes' hate interrupted him. When the hate was over, he returned to his cubicle, took the Newspeak dictionary from the shelf, pushed the speak right to one side, cleaned his spectacles, and settled down to his main job of the morning. Winston's greatest pleasure in life was in his work. Most of it was a tedious routine, but included in it there were also jobs so difficult and intricate that you could lose yourself in them as in the depths of a mathematical problem. Delicate pieces of forgery in which you had nothing to guide you except your knowledge of the principles of Ingsoc and your estimate of what the party wanted you to say. Winston was good at this kind of thing. On occasion, he had even been entrusted with the rectification of the Times' leading articles, which were written entirely in Newspeak. He unrolled the message that he had set aside earlier. It ran, Times March 12, 83, reporting BB Day Order Double Plus, Ungood Refs Unpersons Rewrite Full Wise Up Sub Anti-Filing in Old Speak or Standard English This Might Be Rendered, the reporting of Big Brother's order for the day in the Times of December 3, 1983 is extremely unsatisfactory and makes references to non-existent persons. Rewrite it in full and submit your draft to higher authority before filing. Winston read through the offending article. Big Brother's order for the day, it seemed, had been chiefly devoted to praising the work of an organization known as FFCC, which supplied cigarettes and other comforts to the sailors in the floating fortresses. A certain comrade Withers, a prominent member of the inner party, had been singled out for special mention and awarded a decoration, the Order of Conspicuous Merit Second Class. Three months later, FFCC had suddenly been dissolved with no reasons given. One could assume that Withers and his associates were now in disgrace, but there had been no report of the matter in the press or on the telescreen. That was to be expected, since it was unusual for political offenders to be put on trial or even publicly denounced. The great purges involving thousands of people with public trials of traitors and thought criminals who made abject confession of their crimes and were afterwards executed were special showpieces not occurring oftener than once in a couple of years. More commonly, people who had incurred the displeasure of the party simply disappeared and were never heard of again. One never had the smallest clue as to what had happened to them. In some cases, they might not even be dead. Perhaps 30 people personally known to Winston, not counting his parents, had disappeared at one time or another. Winston stroked his nose gently with a paper clip. 
In the cubicle across the way, Comrade Tillotson was still crouching secretively over his speakwrite. He raised his head for a moment. Again the hostile spectacle flash. Winston wondered whether Comrade Tillotson was engaged on the same job as himself. It was perfectly possible. So tricky a piece of work would never be entrusted to a single person. On the other hand, to turn it over to a committee would be to admit openly that an act of fabrication was taking place. Very likely as many as a dozen people were now working away on rival versions of what Big Brother had actually said, and presently some master brain in the inner party would select this version or that, would re-edit it and set in motion the complex processes of cross-referencing that would be required, and then the chosen lie would pass into the permanent records and become truth. Winston did not know why Withers had been disgraced. Perhaps it was for corruption or incompetence. Perhaps Big Brother was merely getting rid of a too popular subordinate. Perhaps Withers or someone close to him had been suspected of heretical tendencies. Or perhaps, what was likeliest of all, the thing had simply happened because purges and vaporizations were a necessary part of the mechanics of government. The only real clue lay in the words refs unpersons, which indicated that Withers was already dead. You could not invariably assume this to be the case when people were arrested. Sometimes they were released and allowed to remain at liberty for as much as a year or two years before being executed. Very occasionally some person whom you had believed dead long since would make a ghostly reappearance at some public trial where he would implicate hundreds of others by his testimony before vanishing, this time forever. Withers, however, was already an unperson. He did not exist. He had never existed. Winston decided that it would not be enough simply to reverse the tendency of Big Brother's speech. It was better to make it deal with something totally unconnected with its original subject. He might turn the speech into the usual denunciation of traitors and thought criminals, but that was a little too obvious. While to invent a victory at the front, or some triumph of overproduction in the ninth three-year plan might complicate the records too much. What was needed was a piece of pure fantasy. Suddenly there sprang into his mind, ready-made as it were, the image of a C.E.R., Tane Comrade Ogilvy, who had recently died in battle in heroic circumstances. There were occasions when Big Brother devoted his order for the day to commemorating some humble rank-and-file party member whose life and death he held up as an example worthy to be followed. Today he should commemorate Comrade Ogilvy. It was true that there was no such person as Comrade Ogilvy, but a few lines of print and a couple of faked photographs would soon bring him into existence. Winston thought for a moment, then pulled the speak right towards him and began dictating in Big Brother's familiar style, a style at once military and pedantic, and because of a trick of asking questions and then promptly answering them. What lessons do we learn from this fact, comrades? The lesson, which is also one of the fundamental principles of Ingsoc, that, etc., etc., easy to imitate. At the age of three, Comrade Ogilvy had refused all toys except a drum, a submachine gun, and a model helicopter. At six, a year early, by a special relaxation of the rules, he had joined the spies. At nine, he had been a troop leader. At eleven, he had denounced his uncle to the thought police after overhearing a conversation which appeared to him to have criminal tendencies. At seventeen, he had been a district organizer of the Junior Anti-Sex League. At nineteen, he had designed a hand grenade which had been adopted by the Ministry of Peace and which at its first trial had killed thirty-one Eurasian prisoners in one burst. At twenty-three, he had perished in action pursued by enemy jet planes while flying over the Indian Ocean with important dispatches. He had weighted his body with his machine gun and leapt out of the helicopter into deep water, dispatches and all. An end, said Big Brother, which it was impossible to contemplate without feelings of envy. Big Brother added a few remarks on the purity and single-mindedness of Comrade Ogilvy's life. He was a total abstainer and a non-smoker, had no recreations except a daily hour in the gymnasium and had taken a vow of celibacy, believing marriage and the care of a family to be incompatible with a twenty-four-hour-a-day devotion to duty. He had no subjects of conversation except the principles of Ingsoc, and no aim in life except the defeat of the Eurasian enemy and the hunting down of spies, saboteurs, thought criminals, and traitors generally. Winston debated with himself whether to award Comrade Ogilvy the Order of Conspicuous Merit, in the end, he decided against it because of the unnecessary cross-referencing that it would entail. Once again, he glanced at his rival in the opposite cubicle. 
Something seemed to tell him with certainty that Tillotson was busy on the same job as himself. There was no way of knowing whose job would finally be adopted, but he felt a profound conviction that it would be his own. Comrade Ogilvy, unimagined an hour ago, was now a fact. It struck him as curious that you could create dead men but not living ones. Comrade Ogilvy, who had never existed in the present, now existed in the past. And when once the act of forgery was forgotten, he would exist just as authentically, and upon the same evidence as Charlemagne or Julius Caesar.